and welcome everyone to the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum. My name is Mary and I'm going to be your guide through the museum part of today's program. To imagine what Nakajima District was like. Um, and Nakajima District was a bustling downtown area that existed right here 77 years ago. Um, and so I would like to imagine as we walk, as we look at these scenes from Nakajima District, what the morning of August 6th was like. Um, so it was a Monday morning. There had been an air raid uh, alert that night, but it ended at 7.30. And so the people of Nakajima were beginning to go about their everyday morning routines. For example, um, students, middle school and high school students, weren't going to school at that time. Instead, they might have been going to their work placements at building demolition sites or at factories. Um, parents might have been tidying their homes. The elderly might have been working in the garden or taking care of children. And shopkeepers and housewives from all over the city had gathered here in the morning to buy produce and vegetables coming up and down the river. And so the people of Nakajima really imagined, just like we might every day, that their lives would continue just as they always have. But at 8.15 a.m. that morning, some people in Nakajima happened to look up at the sky and saw something twinkling, falling. So most people didn't see it at all, but that object dropped for 43 seconds and exploded. And there was a bright light, a fire, and a blast wind, and all of the families, communities, uh, workplaces, infrastructure, the very fabric of society here in Hiroshima disappeared in an instant. After the dust had cleared and the massive firestorm had subsided, this is what was left of Hiroshima. Next, we're going to come to a diorama that was created using computer graphics technology. And this diorama will show us what happened in Hiroshima from an aerial view. We might have a to wait a second for it to reset. We just saw the perspective from inside the plane and from on the ground. From here, we'll be able to see what Nakajima looked like before the atomic bombing once again. And as you'll see in a moment, um, it was very bright and beautiful, just like modern day Hiroshima. It was a very hot summer day. The cicadas were very loud. And here you can see two places where Annalise introduced you to earlier, the IOE Bridge, which was the original target of the bombing, and the Hiroshima Prefectural Industrial Promotion Hall here, um, which was probably the most gorgeous building in Hiroshima, sort of like Times Square. Now we're going to watch the bomb drop. And it exploded 600 meters in the air. Within one second, the ground temperature reached 3,000 to 4,000 degrees Celsius. Anyone who was outside and directly exposed became very severely burned, and many died instantly. After that, there was the blast wind, as you saw in the BBC video, completely crushed the city of Hiroshima. Bodies were flung into the air, others were crushed under buildings, and movable objects became like flying projectiles that injured people. And Hiroshima became this wasteland. As you can see here, by the end of the year, 140,000 people had died. The museum where I'm currently talking to you from is located 400 meters from where the hypocenter was, as you can see here. So from now, we're going to enter the main exhibit of the museum, where we're going to see pictures and drawings of what it was like on the ground that day and afterwards. We're going to see items that survived the atomic bombing, and we're also going to learn about stories of people who did not survive. And I think um, one of the reasons 
that this next exhibit we're going to, and also the museum as a whole, is so powerful, is thanks to the hard work of the many curators and museum staff who painstakingly chose each item in order to reach us with the message of Hiroshima. And today I'm happy to announce that we have the privilege of speaking with the deputy director of the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum, Toya-san. Hello, Toya-san. Konnichiwa. Um, we're so grateful to have you with us today. And Aya-san will be uh, interpreting for us today. So um, Toya-san, the first question I'd like to ask you is about the renewal of this exhibit. I hear that it was renewed a few years ago, and I wonder during that renewal process what things you and the museum staff thought about and prioritized. まず最初に第一の質問ですけれども、数年前にここが離乳屋されたと聞いています。その際に特に見せたかったこと、変えたかったことなどはありますでしょうか。はい。平和記念資料館ここは広島の被爆の実相と核兵器の廃絶と世界
as uh, I was in charge of renovating this building, uh, the museum, the average visiting time of the visitors were about 45 to 50 minutes. 以前の東館からの見学ルートでは東館を見学して本館の見学資料の展示を見学していただく本館の見学時間はわずか10分程度しかございませんでした。Before the renovation, when people or the, when visitors were coming from the first floor of the East Building led to the main building, the average visiting time of the visitors in the main building was only about 10 minutes. 私たちは本館の被爆資料を見学していただくことが最も重要なことと考えております。We we think that it's the most important thing for the visitor to see in the main building and that's where we present all the the belongings and the materials from the uh the war itself. このため館の全面リニューアルではまず東館の3階に上がっていただいて導入展示を見ていただいたら直ちに本館の展示を見ていただくルートに変更しましたnd so for the renovation we've decided to first lead the visitors to the third floor of the east building and after the introductory exhibit we, we immediately lead uh, visitors to the main building このことがリニューアルの大きなポイントです。So that's the main point of the renewal of the museum. Thank you. So it sounds like you really prioritized leading people into the main exhibit so that they could have the maximum amount of time there and really feel the power of all of these objects. Um, the last question we'd like to ask you, Toya-san, is um, what do you most hope that the ICANN Academy members see in the museum today? 2つ目の質問ですけれども、今回参加してくれているアカデミーの皆さんに一番見てほしい、感じてほしいことは何でしょうか。この渡り廊下の向こう正面に焼け野原に立つ少女の写真が展示してあります。Straight head to the the hallway, there is a picture of one girl standing at the open field. ここから先の展示は被爆者の遺品や写真、そして生産な生産な写真が展示してあります。After uh, the photograph in the main building, there are personal belongings um, and photographs that are uh, describing the horrific experience that they've had on the day. 私たちは一つ一つの資料に。優劣や評価をつけることはいたしておりません。We never evaluate each uh, individual items that we present exhibit in this hall. すべての資料について心を落ち着かせて一つ一つの資料に向き合って広島で何が起こったか見学していただきたいと思ってます。And so we really hope that uh, for each individual exhibit that you see today, just make, your, make yourself calm and feel uh, anything that you can see from the exhibit. Thank you so much, Deputy Director Toya-san. That's some really excellent background before we enter the main exhibit. So thank you so much for your time. Arigatou gozaimashita. Hi. All right, with that, why don't we head down this hallway into the main exhibit? So, um, as Toya-san was saying, it's important to kind of mindset here. You can see from this tunnel, the way it's lit, it almost feels like we're walking back in time um, to 1945. And I think this exhibit, learning about what happened in Hiroshima on the day can be very intense, very overwhelming, very shocking. The first time I visited this museum, I was actually a sophomore in college, and I had never learned about the atomic bombings in school. And so what I learned here in this museum really changed my life. And we hope that today, this visit to the museum will be equally impactful for all of you. So as Toya-san recommended, let us 
quiet and clear our hearts and minds and prepare to experience Hiroshima, August 6th, 1945. Right this way. So the first picture I'd like to show all of you is of something that a lot of people picture when they think of the atomic bombing, and that is of the mushroom cloud or of the firestorm cloud. As I mentioned briefly before at the diorama, um, Hiroshima, immediately after the bombing, was engulfed in a massive firestorm. It, it's a city made of wood. Um, and so most of the pictures you see that are said to be the uh, mushroom cloud are actually of the firestorm cloud, of all of the smoke billowing into the air. And you can see how massive this, cl this cloud of smoke was by looking down here at these tiny people in the corner here, right? These are people outside of the city witnessing what's happening to Hiroshima and seeing this huge firestorm cloud rise up into the air. And they had no idea that an atomic bomb had just been dropped on the city. So this is a perspective from outside of the city when the, drum bo and when the bomb dropped. And now we're going to see um, a perspective from underneath the mushroom cloud. These are articles of clothing that belonged to mobilized students who were in the center of the city when the bomb dropped. Um, during the war, due to the labor shortage, many high school and middle school students didn't go to school. They were actually mobilized to work in factories and building demolition sites to, um, to make fire breaks. And that's why over 8,400 of them were in the center of the city on the day of the bombing. And their bodies were charred black and flung into the air by the blast wind, and 75% of them died that day. So behind me now, you can see a wall of photos and drawings that depict the injuries and burns that people sustained on that day. For example, this is a picture of a person with extremely horrific burns, a trigger warning for those of you who maybe are uncomfortable seeing. Um, but within 1.2 uh, kilometers of the hypocenter, people who were directly exposed to the bombing suffered burns through all layers of their skin, and many of them died immediately or in the days following. I also want to draw your attention to these pictures that were drawn by the survivors of what they witnessed. In this uh, picture particular, you can see a person trapped under a building. And this is a really common theme in the survivors' testimonies, that when they were fleeing the, um, the destruction and the fires in the city, there were so many people trapped under buildings calling for help whom they couldn't save. And that's become a very, um, it's become a very traumatic memory for many survivors. And of course, the people who died in Hiroshima didn't only suffer from the heat and the bomb blast, but also from the effects of radiation. Um, the radiation emitted within one mile, uh, within one kilometer of the hypocenter, and within one minute of the explosion was lethal. And many, many people who seemed to be fine at first died in the days and months following the bombing of acute symptoms such as diarrhea, hair loss, um, high fever, and these purple death spots like you can see on this soldier here. And another example of the acute symptoms of radiation, I'd like to introduce Akiko and Toru, who are siblings. They were exposed to the atomic bombing one kilometer from the hypocenter in a wooden building, and only four days after, their hair started falling off in clumps. Um, and Akiko's gums started bleeding. Four years after the bombing, Toru died of bone marrow disease. And 20 years later, Akiko followed, dying of cancer. So now we are entering the part of the museum that has items uh, that were owned by people who died in the bombing. And probably the most famous of those items is this tricycle here. Perhaps some of you have seen it before. This tricycle belonged to three-year-old Shinichi Tetsutani, and he was playing on this tricycle in front of his house when the bomb exploded. He and the tricycle sustained severe burns, and Shinichi died later that night. His father, imagining that Shinichi would want to play with this tricycle in the afterlife, buried his son and the tricycle together in the backyard of their home, 
But 40 years after the bombing in 1985, he unearthed his son's remains to move to the family grave, and he donated this tricycle to the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum in the hopes that people that saw it would realize the horrors of a nuclear weapon that indiscriminately murders not only adults, but also children. And there's so many items in this room in particular, like this bento box, we're not going to look in detail today, that have very personal stories attached to them and very moving stories like Shinichi and his father's. So if you are interested in learning more about the items here, we really encourage you to um, check out the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum's website database where you can find a lot of really excellent information. Um, so we talked a little bit earlier about the acute after effects of radiation, but there were also longer term after effects caused by the radiation. You can see up here um, a photo of a survivor with really horrible keloid scars, which are formed when burns heal and were extremely painful. Other um, more long-term after effects included things like cataracts, leukemia, and various different kinds of cancers. And here we have a panel um, describing what happened to some people who were in the womb when they were exposed to the atomic bombing. They were still in their mother's tummies. Um, many of them were born with a condition called A-bomb microcephaly. So their heads were born smaller than normal, uh, leading to various physical and mental disabilities. The final place that I want to bring you in the museum today is to the story of Sadako Sasaki, who's perhaps one of the most famous atomic bomb survivors in the world. This is a picture of her here. Sadako was two years old when she was exposed to the atomic bombing in her home 1.6 kilometers from the hypocenter. And she miraculously appeared unharmed. She grew up to be a very um, uh, fast and energetic child, but in sixth grade, she uh, was diagnosed with leukemia. This is a picture of her in a kimono that her parents bought her to celebrate the coming of her teen years, but she never made it to 13. Sadako's legacy is the paper crane. I'm not sure, maybe many of you have heard of a paper crane before, but there's a legend in Japan that if you fold 1,000 paper cranes, you'll be granted a wish. And Sadako folded over 1,300 of these cranes, praying for her health. These are actual paper cranes that she folded herself. And you can see how tiny they are. That's because she folded them using the labels from her medicine containers. There wasn't a lot of paper around at that time. And thanks to Sadako, the paper crane has become an international symbol of a world without nuclear weapons, of a peaceful world. I don't know how many of you have ever tried to fold a paper crane, but it's quite difficult. I have lived in Hiroshima for six years and still can't fold one. Each one takes quite a bit of time and care to fold. And yet Hiroshima Peace Park receives over 10 million of these cranes every year, each one representing the hope of mostly children, but so many people from all around the world that nuclear weapons be eliminated forever. All right, how are we doing everyone? That's the end of the main exhibit. I'd like to take a pause here before we move on and perhaps take a question. Mireille, would you join me? Yes. Do we have any questions in the chat? We do not have any questions just yet. Mm -hmm. um, but so in the meantime, I mm -hmm. would like to ask you, mm -hmm. uh, what is one of the exhibits that mm -hmm. has been most impressionable to you? Mm, that's a great question, Mireille. So, um, my, I, they are constantly changing the exhibits, especially in this main hall. But I remember the first time that I came here, there was exhibited um, clothing of a young boy named Jiro. And um, this young boy in particular, for some reason, his story made me cry. I was in tears in the museum. And he, um, his, his, he experienced the bombing, went back to his home, and I think his mother had passed out in the house and it was on fire. So he actually used his body to roll over the flames. He went to get help from his mother and actually saved her and he ended up passing away. Um, so just these really personal stories of um, especially children, I think it's really hard um, to you know, read the stories of children who passed away in the bombing um, and that is probably the story that impacted me the most. Whenever I come here, I tell people to try to find 
one um, kibaksha to really personally connect with. And when I, when I say that, I always think of Jiro in the back of my mind. Thank you for that question. Mm -hmm. We now have one question. Great. Is there an official number of how many people have been affected by the nuclear disaster? Is it representative for the victims? The generations that came after the disaster and their health, social, environmental problems are taken into account on the national official narrative? Hmm. I'm not so a number, a number that represents the number of people who have been affected by nuclear weapons in general. Um, I'm not sure about that. That's a really good question. Um, I know that 140,000 people died in Hiroshima by the end of 1945, and many more people have died due to atomic bomb-related causes since then. I think almost 70,000 in Nagasaki as well. Annalise, feel free to chime in if, if you have some knowledge here. Um, and I know, too, that the Hiroshima government uh, has recently recognized black rain Right. survivors as well. So um, after the atomic bombing, black rain, kind of like radioactive rain, fell from the sky. And so people who weren't in the city at the time, even if they were a bit removed, if they were exposed to black rain, actually Sadako was exposed to black rain, um, they often had various ra um, radiation sickness um, but they, up until now, hadn't been recognized as survivors. And the government, uh, if you are proven to be a hibaksha, then you can get a like free medical care from the government and things like that. I hope that answers your question. Do you have anything to add, Mireille? No, I think that answered it. OK. Yeah, yeah I mean, there's so many more people, um, as I'm sure you know, who have been infected around the world by nuclear testing as well. I'm not sure if there's a number that includes everything. Um, but we still have a little time. Oh, OK. Yeah. Do we have another question? Yes, we do. How were the humanitarian efforts organized after the bombing? Ambulances, hospitals? Also, which humanitarian organizations besides ICRC was pre present in Hiroshima after the bombing? That's another great question. So to my knowledge, and this is kind of the ICRC's main point about nuclear weapons, is that there is no humanitarian response to a nuclear explosion. Um, so all of the, like when I hear survivors talk, a lot of them say that all the hospitals were destroyed. Many, most of the doctors had died. Um, I don't, I, I know that there were, for example, volunteer firefighters who came from other, um, other cities into the city to help. But I haven't heard of any humanitarian organizations who were actually in Hiroshima helping at that time. Um, and again, like the ICRC says that it would not send people to help because there is, there's nothing you can do in that situation. There's not enough beds. There's not enough supplies. Mm -hmm. um, have you heard anything about humanitarian organizations in the city? No, not organizations, yeah. yes. Just right. people trying to help <coughs> each other. Mm -hmm. So I think we can take one more question. OK. OK. I wonder who usually go and visit the museum. Is it a popular place for the local people in Hiroshima or a popular place for the tourists? I see. Another great question. So I would say, in my experience of living in Hiroshima, it's a very popular spot for tourists, but not so much for locals. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and the reason is, like, for example, when I lived in Boston for seven years, I didn't often go to Boston tourism spots, mm. right? You live in the city, you maybe go once, but other than that, you go about your regular life. I think a lot of people who live in Hiroshima are not necessarily really aware or, or thinking about peace all the time. They're just living their normal lives. But I think one of the reasons to visit Hiroshima for tourists is to come to the museum. So I think it is very much mostly tourists, school field trips, um, and people like that. Yes, I agree. Awesome. Well, thank you all thank so you. much for your wonderful questions. So we have just emerged from this very dark, intense experience into this hallway. It's kind of hard to see now, but it's actually overlooking the Peace Park. So I'd like to go back to Annalise now, where we'll take a look at some of the monuments in the park commemorating what happened on this day. So I think all of you at ICANN Academy have had quite a bit of time learning about what happened in Hiroshima, uh, both before and today. But 
Um, I'm sure you've also learned a little bit about Nagasaki, and so I don't want to move on from here until we've talked a little bit about Nagasaki. We have here two to scale models of Little Boy, the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima, and of Fat Man, the bomb that was dropped over Nagasaki. There is a saying in Japanese, Ikari no Hiroshima, Inori no Nagasaki, which essentially means while Nagasaki rages, Hiroshima prays. Uh, sorry, at, while Hiroshima rages, Nagasaki prays. And the reason for that is that the largest community of Christians in East Asia actually lived in Nagasaki at the time before the bombing. They had suffered 250 years of persecution at the hands of the Japanese government, and they were just being able to practice their faith freely and come out of hiding. They had created a new community in Urakami, which was a little bit removed from the center of Nagasaki City. But on August 9th, 1945, uh, Fat Man, a bomb blessed by a Catholic priest, was dropped right over Urakami, this marginalized and yet blossoming community, really devastating it. Um, my mentor and former chairman of the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum, Stephen Leeper, or former chairman of the organization that used to run this museum, um, he always used to tell me that the bomb in Hiroshima could teach us so much about the horrors of nuclear war. And the Nagasaki bomb, that man, of course, teaches us the same thing but it has this added layer of um, helping us to think about the role of faith and religion in conversations about peace and war. Before we move on, I think we have time to take one more question. Okay. Well, we do not have any new questions here, mm -hmm. but since you mentioned Nagasaki, mm -hmm. and I'm sure you've been to Nagasaki, mm -hmm. what are your impressions? What are the differences mm -hmm. between Hiroshima and Nagasaki? That's a great question. So this is just my personal opinion, and maybe some others and um, staff in the chat can back us up. But um, I noticed that um, Hiroshima uh, as a city, I think, really focuses on the history of the bombing as being the message that it wants to promote to the world. And Nagasaki, of course, has that as well. But I think Nagasaki has maybe uh, it promotes a more diverse history. So for example, in Nagasaki, there's not only the Christian history, but um, Nagasaki was also home to Dejima, which was one of the only um, places that foreigners could visit uh, or come to uh, Japan during the Tokugawa isolation period. So there's a rich history in Nagasaki of multiculturalism with the Dutch and um, the Chinese and, and um, things like that. I also, um, noticed that in the Nagasaki Museum, there seems to be a lot of, a, a lot of information about global hibakusha, which I was happy to see. Um, but I don't know, Mirai, do you have any impressions of both or either? I've actually only been to Nagasaki when I was a very young child. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I have, n I don't remember anything about the museum. Mm. So I, I, it's one of the places I would really love to visit. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I also remember, if I'm remembering correctly, I believe they also have like actual organs in the museum displayed, like actual human organs and um, from people who experience the radiation. So that I think was pretty shocking for me to see. Mm -hmm. There's nothing like that here in the Hiroshima Museum. Although there are pieces of keloid scars that you can see. But yeah, that's a really great question. All right, um, with that, thank you very much. I think we can move on to the final part of our tour. Um, be careful not to fall down the stairs here while I talk. And that's the part about the rebuilding of Hiroshima. I think when most people imagine Hiroshima, they think of the wasteland, the burnt plain that it became after the atomic bombing. But that's not the only narrative here. There's also a narrative of resilience and hope and um, optimism, a narrative of humanity overcoming seemingly insurmountable obstacles to survive and thrive. And this part of Hiroshima's history really encompasses that narrative. I know um, when I talk to survivors, of course they tell me that after the bombing, they were filled with so much grief and rage and hopelessness. But um, after some time passed, they realized that if they wanted to make sure what they had experienced never happened again, they would have to transform not only their city, 
but also themselves. A lot of the survivors tell me, Mary, if you are not peaceful on the inside, you cannot expect to create peace outside of yourself. And so the survivors began this slow process of transforming not only themselves and their hearts and their minds, but also their city into a symbol of peace around the world. And one example of this is the um, Hiroshima Peace Memorial City construction law that was passed four years after the bombing. And this law mandated that Hiroshima architecturally um, and spatially reconstruct itself in the image of peace. Some other ways that I think Hiroshima embodies this peace culture city um, spirit, for example, I've noticed that um, for a lot of elected politicians in Hiroshima, a lot of them need to have good standing with the hibakusha, and they need to have a solid peace platform in order to be elected. And that's kind of unthinkable uh, in America to imagine a politician being elected on a peace platform. Uh, another example is that in Hiroshima, peace education is actually mandated throughout all levels of education. Um, and there's even kind of mainstream peace. There's lots of peace cafes, peace nail salons, peace hotels. Um, everywhere you look, you can see peace. And of course, the survivors um, don't only campaign for a world without nuclear weapons for Japan. They do it for the whole world. This is a picture of a former mayor of Hiroshima um, sit having a sit-in in in the peace park to protest global nuclear testing. And so I feel so privileged and lucky to live in a city where peace literally surrounds me every single day. And um, to close, I hope that yeah, I hope that um, all of you take away from this tour not only the horrors of nuclear weapons, which I'm sure you're all aware of, but also this message that Hiroshima offers of inspiration and hope. And I think especially as young activists who are really um, working to abolish nuclear weapons, there is so much inspiration that we can draw from the story of the survivors to keep us energized in this fight. And I know all of you are, are working in various fields, whether you are Emma working with um, children in theater and art to create peace, or whether you are Juliana um, working with UNESCO to create global citizenship education curricula. There's just a few people I talked to the last time I spoke with all of you, but you are all doing such inspiring work, and I'm so grateful that we can connect in this way uh, and learn about Hiroshima together today. So before we pass the baton back to Annalise for our final part of the tour, maybe we can take another question. Yes. Thank you for the question. Is there any form of cooperation between Hiroshima Prefecture and Nagasaki Prefecture or local organization from both prefectures when it comes to spreading awareness about the bombings? Any joint projects? That's a great question. I'm, I'm almost positive there are. Um, I wonder if maybe Kawasaki-san or Annalise has any um, I know just from my perspective, I work at a youth-led nonprofit, and there are joint projects that we have with uh, our young people in Hiroshima and youth in Nagasaki who are kind of working on interesting peace education initiatives. But I'm sure that more formally, the governments are right. definitely connected. Mm -hmm. Do, have you heard of anything, Mire? I have, but nothing specific is coming mm -hmm. to mind. But um, prefecturally, or, I, I think there are things that mm -hmm. have happened. and. Mm -hmm. Uh, different NPOs and organizations have uh, worked with both uh, hibakushas from um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, mm -hmm. for example. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so maybe Kawasaki-san and Annalise, if you have more information, maybe you can elaborate or write well, answers in the chat. Yes, Kawasaki-san said cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki are working very closely together. Yes. Thank Excellent. You. Thank you so much for your question. Thank all of you for your questions. You. And with that, we are going to pass it back to Annalise for our final monument of the day.